now to the panel on a smart learning ecosystem and the gene of the new normality. So first of all, let me thanks the panelists. Uh, I've already introduced you, Sebastian. Uh, now I would like to introduce uh, the other panelists. Uh, Inga Birgland, that you already know because has been one of our uh, invited speaker and uh, is Professor of Human Geography at the University of uh, Southeastern Norway. Uh, she's an uh, interesting interdisciplinary approach uh, to sustainable development and climate that we have, uh, we have seen as a change transformation. In particular, uh, her focus is on uh, a people place relation education for sustainability via place-based approach and also the cultural sustainability of post-industrial plays uh, uh, you heard about. Uh, then I would like to introduce uh, Ross Hall uh, of the Jacob Foundation. Uh, he worked for many years as a, a system change in education, uh, starting with Pearson, where uh, he, uh, he established uh, their education, economic, uh, social development business. Then uh, lead the, the Ashoka's global education strategy, uh, which focuses on the creation of uh, thriving learning ecosystem. And uh, then founded and uh, the Waving Lab for, uh, from Ashoka, aiming at to advance the practice of uh, Waving Learning ecosystem, we will probably uh, uh, hear about. And uh, now is co-leading the learning society. Uh, learning societies uh, with the uh, portfolio with Jekyll Foundation that uh, focuses on uh, creating again a thriving learning ecosystem in Ghana, uh, Ivory Coast, and Switzerland. Uh, then we have uh, uh, Aurelio Amaral that is uh, replacing uh, Mina Hussein that at the last moment was not able to take part in the uh, panel and uh, she apologized herself. And uh, Aurelio is the head of a learning ecosystem track at WISE that we have uh, listened a few minutes ago is uh, one of uh, the main track at WISE. And the initiative uh, is uh, of course an initiative of Qatar Foundation and uh, uh, that is uh, where uh, is uh, trying to identify and promote innovation products in education. Uh, the initiative uh, under this uh, track umbrella includes, uh, as we have also heard about, the learning vo learner's voice uh, uh, dedicated to K-12 students, uh, and then, uh, then a learning ecosystem living lab uh, we heard about, and then maybe we heard mo even more details uh, in, the, in, the, in the next uh, uh, hour. Uh, finally, I would like to introduce uh, Patrizia Marti, that already uh, most of you knows because has been invited speaker a couple of years ago at uh, SLERT. Uh, she's an associate professor at the University of uh, Siena, and uh, the reason for which she's here is not the only one, but the main reason of, uh, for which she's here because she's here because she's the director of the Santa Chiara uh, Fab Lab that I don't know if it can be defined in a living lab, but certainly is a very active lab, where she managed to participate in innovation project. And uh, her research is very wide, actually, but uh, concern mainly design system facing cultural, aesthetic, and social issue uh, through uh, embodied experience. So, um, let at this point uh, introduce uh, the first run, if I can, and uh, um, I would like just to show a couple of slides to introduce uh, uh, the first run. Uh, okay, as uh, most of you know, uh, um, our understanding of smart learning ecosystem uh, is that of uh, a more or less complex digital uh, place uh, that is uh, uh, people or student-centered 
and there is uh, that means also um, that is continuous coevolution with the context and environment and uh, its smartness should uh, lead uh, you you can define a smart an ecosystem if uh, actually uh, the individuals own uh, not only a high level of skill but uh, in this ecosystem they feel strongly motivated to continuous uh, ad adequate challenge and uh, also um, uh, the um, smartness what we define smartness is a multi-dimensional uh, uh, construct uh, that uh, uh, is strictly related to the well-being of the actors involved in the, in the activities uh, can uh, should uh, can uh, should be measured by mean of participatory approach, integrating top-down uh, bottom-up uh, strategies. Um, and this uh, evaluation, of course, is part of a, a loop that lead to co-design, improvement plan, and then to social accountability. On this basis, um, I would like uh, uh, really uh, very curious, uh, we all are very curious to hear about uh, your perspective ab about smart learning ecosystem. So which are the founding element, uh, the relevance uh, for your institution, cultural context, uh, any simplification of implementation. Please, I, I leave the floor to the first one, that is Inga. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yes, please. Super, super. Uh, oh, I find it really difficult to be the first panelist uh, in this open discussion. Um, uh, because I'm completely new to this framework of smart learning ecosystems. So um, um, uh, I can only comment and discuss um, while having this in mind that, that you remember this, a very limited reading and limited understanding of all the work that I understand has been developed. Um, I do have uh, always a very sympathetic attitude to new things. So, um, but also I'm having my own um, sort of research experiences and research interests and uh, educational experiences as a teacher educator and as a um, teacher educator in subject teaching in, in um, an integrated social studies uh, teacher training um, um, study program where we teach history, geography, and um, general social science for primary schools. But I have also a background from tourism studies, um, all also from cultural and arts managed management studies um, and from doctoral training in interdisciplinary culture studies. But I'm very new to innovation projects. Um, but we see in Norwegian higher education more focus on innovation. And uh, we, of course, understand this as part of the new competitive climate for higher education and the lack of funding uh, and the challenges of public sector higher education, which is typical in many European countries. Um, what I find positive and interesting with this concept and framework is that um, uh, it's focused on people, people-centered approaches. I think very often we miss that in, in much in much research and in, in, in much public work for transition. Uh, the focus on well-being and quality of life and connecting the people-centered to the societal level. Um, I think that's uh, something I, I also share um, very much. And I noted that the aim is innovation for sustainable regional development. Um, and the system approach in this is very, uh, very uh, important, of course. Um, so, um, however, I think there is a sort of discourse here 
um, where sustainable gets a little bit lost because there is very much focus on um, uh, the learning tools, the learning systems, while uh, there is, for me at least, uh, an, an interest in, in talking about what type of education do we need in order to actually um, transform society uh, towards sustainability and climate change transformation. So I, I, I would see I would see more um, results where we can uh, understand smart learning ecosystems as actively um, changing society towards sustainability and, and climate change uh, transformation. So the assessment, the, um, the outcomes, the products, the results, objectives of the work is really important uh, for achieving sustainability. So I, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm, I'm sort of a person, a human geographer. I like to take my teacher students uh, doing field work in real places. I don't, uh, even though if, even though I um, teach in a teacher study program where we have um, used online teacher education uh, since 2008 as one of the first universities in Norway. Um, I think I am more inclined working with real landscapes rather than the, the virtual or digital landscapes. Um, so, so um, we're, as, but um, my university is, um, its strategy is focusing very much on sustainability, but also very much on um, um, exploiting the possibilities and developing research and knowledge and uh, good study programs by integrating digital and communication technology more and more and more recently. So, um, um, uh, for example, we are very much concerned uh, because teacher education is a very centrally organized, it's a very bureaucratic organization in, in Norway to do teacher education. But what's really important now is professional digital competence. It's one of the basic competences for Norwegian primary school children. So uh, we are uh, embedding and developing what other skills and competences um, regarding digital competence. What do, how do we implement it in our um, the courses, in our study programs, in research, everywhere. Um, and um, there's some, there's very much pressure and development and incentives for uh, primary schools in Norway, which are funded and owned by the municipalities, uh, to equip students with iPads, PC or Chromebooks or, um, and we, we talk about quite a lot of schools as iPad schools. It's become a sort of a thing. Um, but the problem here is the practitioner's skill deficiency. So there's, there's um, much focus on um, the hardware, but the systemics and the interfaces between the people, the children, the teachers, and the technology and their environments, um, there is a lack of understanding of uh, how, how the flows of communication and learning go here and where the deficiencies are. This is not my area of research at all. Um, but I, as a 
human geographer and very interested in the the other side of the post-human discussions. Uh, the one one side of these discussions go in the human machine interface, right? Uh, and the other goes between the human and the other species interface and the organic world. So where we see humans as a species. I'm more there than in the digital world. So, um, so um, I, I see that uh, with all the important and necessary developments in technology and uh, information technology and these frameworks, um, people go either way. There's some sort of missing link here. Um, people are either digitally obsessed or they are ecologically obsessed, but they are not obsessed with the both things at the same time, I think. And I need really think we need to talk much, much more about how we can use technology and smart learning systems or um, whatever we have uh, in order to um, solve the biggest challenges we have, which are lack of sustainability and climate change. We need, we need really, really to um, put all our efforts together there. So making the link between smart learning ecosystems to climate change transformation and sustainability and the green turning, it's really uh, something that needs to take place. And, the, and also there are, um, uh, we need to do this and remember that our world is um, unjust. There are injustice uh, produced uh, all over and also digital inequalities. So um, um, in order to, for me, um, I work place-based, place-conscious, uh, think across these interfaces of uh, nature culture. Um, and we can also include the digital and the human interface, um, I connect that with place-based approaches. Um, so, so this, um, um, I like the ecosystem concept, um, but following what I was just recently said, um, I think it's a little bit too cognitive for me. There's too little organic uh, systems thinking or the ego is missing, if you understand what I mean. We need to connect these smart learning systems to real ecosystems uh, to change the practices we have developed, which are sustainable. Because these are the challenges for uh, all of us, wherever, because it connects us. Climate change connects us. So that's why we need to work together to solve these uh, great challenges. I think I'll stop there. Uh, thanks very much, Inga. I would like to give the floor to Ross, if he would like to intervene. Sure, thanks so much, Carlo, and thank you, Inga. Um, I'm going to challenge your last point, actually, that um, learning ecosystems are not uh, rooted in ecosystems, because in many instances, actually, they are. And I'm a big proponent of the same thing. So just to, um, to uh, forewarn you that uh, I'll, I'll, I'll gently uh, challenge you on that. So I, um, I work with two organizations, uh, the Jacobs Foundation, which is a Swiss family foundation, and I co-founded the Weaving Lab. And I'll, ref I'll refer to both as we go, as I go along. But to start with the, um, to start with both, actually, 
the ultimate um, objective of the work of these two organizations is essentially to weave learning ecosystems in which there is a central focus on learning to thrive together or learning to live for universal well-being and this means um, essentially whole person development so that people are acting from moment to moment for their own personal well-being and societal well-being and planetary well-being together so there's a central premise here which is the whole the holistic interdependence of everything so that's at the heart of the work that i'm doing at least and i know the the heart of a lot of the work of of many people that i work with what that means essentially is equipping and inclining people with the knowledge skills attitudes values perspectives and other mindsets that enable them as i say to uh, manifest their caring for themselves and others and the planet together in the context of course as you rightly said inga of us now facing significant and perhaps even unprecedented challenges around climate change and biodiversity loss and then all the related social economic cultural and personal well-being challenges what that essentially means is, and uh, I've done a lot of work on this, in fact, I've been speaking with communities uh, for many years in all sorts of settings around the world um, about what is it, what does that mean, this whole person development? And essentially, uh, you get the same 50 to 100 uh, items that people will identify as key learning outcomes from learning ecosystems. Uh, some of them are knowledge-based, some of them are skills based, but more often than not, people will say um, we need to become uh, empathic, we need to become self aware, we need to become resilient, thoughtful, wise, curious, creative, and on goes the list. What's particularly interesting about that list that inevitably comes through is that there's an emphasis on becoming or being. And this suggests strongly that we need to place this the idea of being or becoming at the heart of learning ecosystems. And you can actually see this actually sometimes implicitly, if not explicitly, in work around social and emotional learning, life skills, 21st century skills, etc. But what we are finding is that increasingly by making this explicit, it's helping people to reframe the very idea of learning, which for many people uh, limits is limited entirely to cognitive development, not to broader physical, emotional, cognitive, relational and spiritual development, which we believe is at the heart of this whole person uh, development. It's quite interesting when you have these conversations about these learning outcomes that need to derive from learning ecosystems because often that conversation highlights very strongly the fact that in education systems currently, we tend to fragment the human being. We uh, very, uh, we kind of atomize human beings and we take a very narrow individualistic and highly economic perspective on human development. And this is the antithesis, this approach is the antithesis to that approach. I'll come back to fragmentation in a moment. What's also really interesting in these conversations that I have with communities is I'll often then ask, so what kinds of learning experience or environment are best for developing this wide range of learning outcome? And again, you tend to get the same answers anywhere. Um, you, people will say, well, it's in learning in the community or learning in nature. It's through playful learning or through inquiry or project based learning. It's when you give young people the opportunity to take the lead and to experiment and to fail. They might say it's through meditation or movement or making, etc. And again, you get this very interesting and very consistent list of learning experiences that seem to be essential to provide in learning ecosystems experiences again which sit in counterpart to what you typically find in school systems 
in fact, in very few school systems do you see an emphasis placed on that kind of learning experience. And so a lot of the people we work with are explicitly focused on the provision of these learning experiences. The other thing that is um, interesting to note here is that if you contrast not only the type of learning experience that you would see in this kind of learning ecosystem versus a school system, um, but also the idea that a learning, that a, a school system is often a one size fits all, it's a very fixed uh, kind of experience. What comes through very strongly, very often in learning ecosystems is the idea that the system itself is adapting, uh, not only over time, but it's adapting to the specific learning needs and preferences of those in it. And so there's this high degree of adaptability to variability in learning, which is built into learning ecosystems, at least in theory. And um, that's often the desired approach. So again, you've got this idea of a wide set of learning um, outcomes, a wide set of learning experiences, and this strong adaptability built into the system. Now, when you ask people, who is it who most influences these learning experiences and environments? In other words, who is it who needs to be involved in the creation and evolution of a learning ecosystem? Again, you get very much the same answers everywhere. People will start by saying, well, it's parents and families, it's school teachers and school leaders and staff, etc. Oh, and it's out of school educators and sometimes it's community leaders and many times it's religious or faith leaders, friends, peers, health, social workers, culture makers, etc. People will give you a very rich list of people who have a direct influence over the learning experience of young people. And it's clear that these people need to be coming together, working together and learning together to provide this kind of learning experience that I mentioned earlier. And typically at this point in most systems, these people are highly fragmented. They don't know about each other. They might know about each other. They're not working together. Very often they're competing with one another, competing for money, for voice and attention, and so the existing system in many cases makes it very difficult for these people to actually come together and collaborate in the creation of a learning ecosystem. When you push a bit further and you ask people, well, who else might be involved? You very quickly identify those people who might be policymakers or teaching unions or teacher trainers, education administrators and auditors, researchers and academics, employers, media, funders, etc. Again, you get this very long list of people who are in the second or third line, i.e. have an indirect influence, but nevertheless a profound influence. People who, again, really are currently very fragmented, who need to be brought together with each other and with those frontline actors so that you have this much more, um, you have very strong feedback loops, and as Sebastian said earlier, you're starting to foster trust within these communities. And through those trustful relationships, you're establishing feedback loops, which are often missing. So the work for us at the Jacobs Foundation is trying to bring this, these ideas to life in three geographies, in the Ivory Coast, in Ghana, and in Switzerland. We're quite early still in our process. We've been working for quite a number of years in the Ivory Coast, and we're now accelerating our work more explicitly towards learning ecosystems. But for us, we are essentially um, implementing models that we hope will, um, or rather implementing approaches that we hope will model these kinds of transformation process so that learning ecosystems can emerge out of existing education system models, learning ecosystems, which are defined as diverse and trustful communities, adapting to variability in learning, using evidence informed decision making, we think that evidence is often lacking in this kind of work, to provide this diverse range of learning experiences in order to help everyone develop a diverse range of knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, et cetera, so that everybody in that system is learning to thrive together. 
Now, in order to implement these kinds of uh, approaches, um, we're really interested in the living lab model that Sebastian talked about earlier. Um, we're actually in the process of evaluating to what extent might we adopt lock, stock and barrel, the living lab approach, or perhaps choose um, elements of it. Uh, we've also been very inspired by collective impact theory. And our starting point is to build backbone teams in each of these countries based on collective impact theory, backbone teams which weave change commune, uh, change teams or design teams, those design teams are then uh, in place to weave a wider community. And that wider community is there to essentially model and become their own learning ecosystem. Um, so this is, in other words, a process which is highly participatory, highly inclusive, and highly iterative, a process of identifying diverse actors to come together to foster trustful relationships and essentially bring about or, as I say, become their ideal learning ecosystem. Um, and just to add a small note there, the emphasis with the Weaving Lab is to help people um, develop these competences or this practice of weaving, which is the practice of connecting communities to each other and to a shared purpose, of helping communities collaborate for systemic impact, of helping communities learn together for systemic impact. And at the very deepest level, it's to help people who are doing this work recognize that they are in their system and that to create a thriving learning ecosystem, they themselves need to change. So there is this deep focus on inner change, inner transformation as a prerequisite to systemic transformation. And I'll stop there, uh, Carlo, thank you. Thank you, Ross. And uh, that's time of Aurelio. Would you like to take the floor, please? Thank, thank you so much, Carlo. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here today and also uh, joining uh, amazing colleagues as well. Uh, Seb, uh, Inga, Ross, uh, Patricia, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, as uh, my colleague Sebastian uh, very well introduced the work of WISE and the work that we do on learning ecosystems, um, I would like to uh, share with you a few uh, insights on our most recent action research project uh, conducted in Qatar. Um, so, I hope you can all see my screen now. Um, and I'll start by uh, explaining why we, we decided to, to uh, conduct such a project uh, in the context of Qatar. For, for those who are not uh, familiar with, with the country, Qatar is a small uh, Gulf nation uh, whose economy relies mostly on oil and gas. Uh, but in the past decade or so, there has been a stronger push towards transformation uh, uh, for a more knowledge-based economy rather than just uh, energy-based. Um, and uh, its small population of Qatar is also uh, comprised mostly of uh, foreigners. It's an interesting fact about the country. Uh, almost 90% of the residents in, in the country are, are expats, uh, which brings a lot of diversity, uh, not only in terms of language, but also cultural diversity, and, and also diversity in how we experience uh, uh, learning, learning opportunities, right? Um, so given that uh, uh, Qatar is a country with a, a lot of uh, existing resources um, and existing opportunities as well, um, we uh, decided to investigate what are actually the best ways uh, to make these existing opportunities more uh, accessible, more inclusive, uh, so that uh, uh, learners can can um, experience education in a in a in a fair way, which is something that uh, Inga very very well uh, addressed, um, and uh, we we did that uh, by uh, looking at innovative practices and, and pedagogies that help to promote equity, inclusion, and and, and resilience, uh, and looking also at incentives 
and barriers to to innovation and collaboration among uh, uh, stakeholders in the in the civil society, uh, formal education system, and also non formal education uh, providers. Um, so uh, just briefly, we've engaged with uh, school uh, school leaders, uh, uh, leaders of organizations, experts uh, through surveys, interviews, visioning workshops, and also. We also engage with the ministry, uh, uh, who is a key actor in terms of um, adopting potential recommendations that have uh, uh, policy implications as well. Um, and first and foremost, we try to understand what are the key needs uh, uh, of these learners in, in Qatar, which I think is also key to any project that we develop in education. I mean, the ultimate goal is to, is to address uh, the, the the needs of, of the learners, and I'm very happy to to uh, hear both uh, the intervention from from Inga and from Ross uh, to see that some of the uh, uh, opinions and insights that uh, our stakeholders share with us are aligned with with the visions that that you also shared. Um, so one thing that uh, uh, emerged in, in our findings is that. Informal and extracurricular activities are very much uh, uh, highly regarded by 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 schools, by students, um, and uh, the way, however, that uh, these these opportunities are distributed and accessed uh, differ a lot depending on the type of of education system that a learner falls into. Uh, for example. Um, there are many uh, international uh, uh, private schools uh, in central areas of Doha, the capital of Qatar, that have uh, a lot of connections with, with, with embassies, with uh, private sector organizations, with cultural institutions, and therefore are in a better position to, to foster connections with uh, uh, other actors beyond the formal education system, right? Um, and why uh, is uh, why are those opportunities uh, so so important and so highly valued by 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 the stakeholders in in Qatar? Um, as as you uh, mentioned, Ross, um, this this concept of being and and becoming as a learner is is key to the context uh, of Qatar because um, I would say learner motivation might be one of the main concerns or basically the main uh, concern that uh, uh, educators highlight as a priority uh, given the uniqueness of the country as well um, that has a lot of uh, resources uh, not always will economic empowerment and employment uh, will there be will there be the main drivers uh, uh, for for learners right uh, so there there must be other motivations as well, uh, intrinsic motivations to, to learn. And it's a very much about um, exploring the self, uh, 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 understanding uh, our, our potential, being able to fully participate in a society, uh, and also uh, learning how the, the environment, and I say here environment in a, in a, in a broader sense, uh, how the connections that uh, uh, take place within a community, in a neighborhood, the network of support, family network, community support, uh, play a role as well in, in the learning process. Um, so given that the, the, uh, the collaboration between the formal education system and uh, other actors within the civil society are, are considered as, as very important, we also try to look at the at the barriers to collaboration itself, and why and why they don't happen as effectively and as constantly as as the stakeholders wished. And uh, as most of you might know, time is always a key a key issue. Um, time is is precious, and especially in schools, uh, time can be very much constrained. Uh, 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 educators they have uh, a lot of other tasks beyond beyond teaching, so oftentimes. Uh, engaging in activities uh, with external partners and and doing things uh, like like uh, Inga shared, for example, uh, uh, field activities in perhaps with with uh, external uh, uh, organizations as well, might uh, become uh, challenging uh, due to uh, capacity and and time constraints. 
At a system level as well, uh, we also see uh, some uh, lack of, of, of communication, uh, bureaucratic uh, impediments, uh, uh, funding issues and incentives that might uh, discourage or, 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 or even prevent uh, uh, those form of collaboration. So uh, thinking about that, we workshopped with, with, uh, with the local stakeholders as well some uh, solutions and potential recommendations that could be adopted either by uh, the education system itself, but also by the, by the other actors involved in the process in the broader society. Um, so uh, there, there are a few things that can be done uh, at the human resources level, for example, uh, having um, campaigns uh, and uh, opportunities that uh, improve uh, professional development, that uh, encourage local leadership uh, so that the, the, the education actors can also own more uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, also help uh, uh, learners to, 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 to gain agency on, on, on their own uh, learning process. Uh, from the learning provider's perspective, uh, there is one practice that we, that we identified as, as highly uh, valuable, which is uh, the uh, twinning, uh, coupling together schools that might not have a lot uh, in common. Let's say like a, a, a public school in a more rural area with uh, one of these international schools in the central area of the capital um, to uh, cooperate and they would be able to learn from each other and also share their networks with each other as well, which will be uh, something very, very helpful. Um, having dedicated uh, uh, people responsible to, to coordinate those partnerships and make those links, that's also something that um, both schools and uh, representatives from the civil society could do uh, so that they could like, take off some of the burden from, the, from everyone's uh, everyday's business as usual um, and engage in those type of uh, uh, activities uh, towards collaboration. Um, at, the, at the policy level, uh, improving communication and maybe providing more autonomy for, for, for schools is also something that, that could encourage more uh, um, multi-stakeholder partnership. And uh, as always, um, there, there are tools that could uh, help incentivize uh, those connections, uh, dedicated funding that uh, uh, is tied to collaboration itself, uh, like a CSR uh, program could, uh, instead of just uh, uh, investing in specific uh, uh, training programs in schools, uh, those could be tied to the condition that uh, different set of schools uh, with different, different profiles should engage together in the same project, for example. Um, and of course, uh, and that relates back to to the concept that Carlo was presenting uh, on, on the smartness. So um, the, it, it's also important to, to, to build an infrastructure uh, in which stakeholders can, can, can learn from each other and, and uh, through that uh, provide continuous improvement as well. So uh, codifying as much as possible the, the innovative practices uh, creating spaces and bilingual spaces, which is something quite key in a country like Qatar, where uh, there are multiple uh, languages, uh, Arabic and English coexisting in a way. Um, and of course, uh, having the, 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 the appropriate uh, uh, physical and, and, and digital spaces to, to share this knowledge as well. So these are some of the, some of the uh, findings and recommendations that we surface uh, with, with our ecosystem here. And I would be very curious to, to learn from the rest of you whether they apply in the same way in your own context. Uh, and also if, if there are any suggestions coming from abroad that you would find relevant uh, that we could bring back to, to the community in, in, in Qatar as well. Uh, and that's also, uh, again, part of the, the work that uh, my colleague Sebastian uh, is leading, which is trying to create this global community of practice of implementation of, of, of uh, local ecosystems in, in, in different contexts, in different geographies as well. 
so I'll, I'll stop for now. Um, and I'm happy to, to share a bit more later in the, in the second round. Thank you so much. Thank you, Aurelio. Uh, now is uh, uh, the turn of Patrizia, to which uh, I would like to give the, st the stage. Uh, thank you, Carlo. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yes? Yes. Is, can you yeah. please let now, me yeah. know if yes. you see my screen? Perfect, yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so very interesting to, to learn about the other colleagues before uh, talking about uh, uh, our lab in, uh, uh, in Siena, uh, the University of Siena. Uh, as Carlo said, uh, the, the name is Santa Chiara Lab, is a, um, an interdisciplinary and innovation center of the University of Siena. We started in 2016 uh, with a clear mission. So to, to um, uh, design a space for dialogue, uh, for, uh, let's say, uh, mixing competencies and knowledge. Uh, and, and knowledge. Um, so uh, the, this center is not part of a department. Um, but all the department can work there, but uh, the, the interesting thing is that it is open to everyone, so it's, it's really a place where the business, where the academic world, uh, but also um, public and private institutions um, come and work together. Uh, there are uh, five themes uh, that are uh, the focus of this center is sustainability, um, agri-food, uh, digital, uh, it's very technological, health and learning. And I'm the director of the digital area of the um, uh, Santa Chiara lab. Uh, my lab is a fab lab. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar uh, with Fab Lab, uh, the, the, the name means uh, Personal Fabrication Laboratories, or how the, the, the from the United States people uh, call these labs the Fabulous Lab. So the, 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 the laboratory where you can do almost anything. So this is the, the slogan. It was uh, the, the, the idea was. Uh, uh, promoted by Neil Gershenfeld from MIT, the Center for Beats and Atoms. Uh, we work a lot with, with him and, and with the group there uh, with the idea of um, mixing uh, atoms and beats and uh, stimulate um, innovation through making. So nowadays there are um, around um, uh, 1,570 fab labs in the work. We are in the world. We are uh, connected all together. So this is a way also to share uh, knowledge. But what is interesting is the local dimension. Uh, I think of these spaces. Um, in our case, this is very multidisciplinary. Uh, there are different kind of. Um, competencies from design, psychology, humanities, computer science, engineering. And uh, as I said, we collaborate with uh, um, public and private institutions, but also with, with citizens uh, who come to the Fab Lab with the very concrete problems that they would like to address and they want to uh, build together solutions. So this is a sort of, this is a way of using the making as a way of thinking and learning together and reflecting together. So let me just uh, um, show uh, some examples. So uh, the, 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 the kind of collaborations that we have at, at, at the local, um, in, in, in the community. Um, so in the cultural heritage, for example, we collaborate with museums. Uh, we recently did uh, this project. So it's a, a replica of a, a very important statue from Nicola Pisano. It's, uh, 
uh, is a very important um, artist. And so we collaborated a lot with people uh, and restorators uh, to uh, produce uh, this replica using the technologies in, in the Fab Lab. I will not tell you which one is the original and which one is our copy. Uh, so this is now at the Duomo in Siena. Uh, we collaborate a lot with the schools. Uh, schools are interested in uh, producing new materials for uh, children uh, to learn uh, geography, history, and but the, 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 the interesting thing is that children develop the material and the, uh, the contents uh, they work or play with. Uh, so this is an example for, uh, of a game that we developed with children for learning um, history and, and geography. Um, a lot of emphasis in our work is uh, in uh, trying to learn from local communities and in particular from a community of people with different kinds of disability. Uh, I don't know if I can show you this, uh, this video or I don't know if you can see the hit, but just to give you a flavor of, of the way in which we involve people, they, they come to the Fab Lab and they start playing with technologies. In this case, we designed and developed uh, um, a suite of jewelry for uh, deaf people. Uh, these jewels are able to detect sound of interest um, occurring in the environment and to notify them uh, to uh, deaf people in different ways with the lights, vibration, shape changes. So it's very technological, but everything starts with the embodied experience of people. Um, and uh, and the fact that they want to to share this experience and to start prototyping uh, with us so we immediately make a solution and this thinking through making is is uh, extremely um uh, effective um for engaging uh, people this is a, a deaf uh, student uh, who worked uh, a lot uh, with us um this the, the, this is one of the the jewels that we developed uh, and also financial times uh, last year published a very nice um article promoting this kind of project uh we also do a lot in healthcare um this is an example that i like uh, is a face mask for children for uh, a con for the correction of uh, uh, malocclusion uh, ortho orthodontic ma malocclusion and again uh, we invited uh, children to design their mask and uh, and uh, and they are designed now as superhero masks uh, that are associated to uh, a digital game um, so in this case 120 families participated in the project uh, and now we have a patent uh, and again, it's a kind of innovation that starts uh, really from, um, from people, from real problems, from the, the local communities. Uh, but uh, if I can say something in relation to what Inger and other uh, colleagues mentioned today during the open debate, uh, I, I think uh, th th there is something uh, changing also, at least in, in my fab. So the idea that, of course, everything is very human centric, but there is a lot of attention to the ecosystem and to nature. So, um, for example, this is a project from one of our students from the master degree in communication strategies and technologies and she came to the fab lab to produce bioplastics um, and uh, she started working with local companies um, uh, trying to experiment with uh, mark do you know that uh, in, in Tuscany we produce a lot of wine but we produce also a lot of waste mark waste so she succeeded in uh, transforming uh, the mark in bioplastic and she started designing new products. So this is one of the 
uh, of the, 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 the stuff that she designed. And now she's collaborating a lot with uh, um, local uh, companies uh, using uh, this kind of uh, uh, recycled uh, mark. Um, another very, very super interesting project uh, is this is very new from, again, from students of my course in experience design. Uh, I'm showing this just to uh, reflect with you on this idea that young people are very much inside, uh, worried about uh, nature and they want to do something and they want to design something new for saving nature and for thinking in uh, thinking about the use of technologies uh, really for uh, developing sustainable um, solutions. So this is a project that, that is, uh, the, the, the topic is food and uh, the, the name is Fuduristico, uh, Fuduristic. <laughs> And so they, they, they started with, the, with um, analyzing a, a, um, a, f a phenomenon that we have in Italy, but I'm pretty sure that is quite spread. Um, there is a kind of invasion of uh, jellyfish um, that are destroying the ecosystems of uh, the sea uh, in Italy. Uh, you can see here the distrib distribution of these different kind of jellies. Uh, they basically produce a reduction of 60% uh, of fish um, and uh, other kind of uh, like uh, this uh, um, among the 60 and 70% of fish. So uh, this is also destroying the local uh, economy. So fishermen are really worried about this and they don't know what to do with this, with this problem. So the, the, the students um, started interviewing uh, experts um, and what they design is a, is a new uh, system for, they discovered that the jellyfishes are eatable. Uh, and so they uh, in, um, engaged a famous chef um, and designed a new um, app, a new service uh, for, um, you know, producing new recipes uh, using jellyfish fishes and, um, and also for distributing and also for promoting this idea of a sustainable um, uh, kind of behavior. So they want to change the behavior of people with these new technologies. And it's amazing to see how many people they interviewed and, uh, and involved in their project. So um, I like this idea that uh, students um, are taking their responsibility for this change. Uh, and what we are doing is to try to, to promote as much as we can uh, the um, training on digital technologies and digital fabrication technologies. Uh, we run every year the Fab Academy with the MIT in collaboration with MIT. Um, so to um, train students, I mean, I, I talk about students uh, in a very wide way in, in the sense that they are not just the university students, but uh, everyone can, um, can participate uh, and enroll the, the, the FAB Academy is in English, of course. Uh, but uh, I think that with this kind of uh, um, skills and competencies, and also with this sensibility toward nature and, uh, and the environment around us, um, the students are transforming this idea of human centeredness uh, in something that is uh, uh, in their speech. And uh, this is exactly what, what I'm uh, observing. Um, what is happening in, in our fab lab is, is a moving toward um, a, 
a, a kind of agency that is not just related to the human beings, but also to the nature and to the various resources that we have, um, uh, that, that, that we can, uh, that we live with. I think I, I, can, I will stop here and uh, maybe we can uh, continue to, to discuss about this later. Thank you very much, Patrizia. And thank you all. I would like just to ask to Sebastian if he would like to add something to this first run. I mean, I like the similarities and the differences that have been have been highlighted on certain issues around personalization, trust, community engagement, uh, but also a very different uh, different perspective. Uh, I'd like to make a comment. I mean, uh, I think that now after several uh, uh, intervention, uh, it's uh, quite clear, but I would like to stress it uh, once more. So educational, uh, like technologies could be considered neutral. So it's up to us uh, to shape it. Okay, so uh, and to avoid the misunderstanding, but that now is very clear. Uh, 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 smart planning ecosystem are usually strongly related to sustainability and social responsibility. I mean, uh, uh, Patrizia show a lot of uh, example, but uh, in in a in a smaller scale, this happen uh, uh, everywhere when you try to. Uh, perform a sort of uh, innovation lab with uh, many different schools. So uh, uh, students are the first that are interesting to the environment and to preserve the environment. Indeed, it's not by chance that uh, I mentioned it uh, um, uh, as a, during the introduction uh, as one of the main outcomes, the social responsibility report. This is a very uh, uh, important uh, uh, outcome. And uh, of course, uh, again, I would like to stress that the smartness, I mean, when we, we talk, uh, we like to talk of smart learning ecosystem, not of learning ecosystem, but the smartness of the learning ecosystem, I stress, this, stress it again, is not related with technology, it's not based on technology, it's related to uh, the well-being of the uh, people, and this means also that is related with the preservation of natural resources. Um, the technology backbone, backbone is there because, of course, uh, as you have seen, technologies are relevant, but are not the main, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, element that is driving, driving uh, the, the smartness of the learning ecosystem. So this just to... Uh, to provide a, a, a comment. Is there anyone that would like to add additional comments? Yes, please, Liliana. Maybe. Uh, I thank you all for your presentations. Um, I guess that all of, of you talked about the focus on people. And uh, this is something that uh, we, all of us like to do in order to build systems that meet their needs and uh, uh, do uh, meet their expectations. But um, there are some difficulties and I, I, I would like to note this, uh, for example, in Patricia, by involving people in the process. I know that this is very rich, but what were the main difficulties in the process because uh, our experience is that it takes too long um, although the the the, the systems it, it is worth it but the the industry for example when they want to do that the same process by involving people in this in these uh, in these methods, but using co-design, uh, always put the problem. Okay, that is good, but then it delays the whole process. It takes more time to to translate the what are their behaviors into the systems and how can we help and build those systems? What could be? Uh, how could we? Uh, Agile, uh, make this agile and and uh, and meet both both needs. 
Okay, thanks for uh, your uh, intervention and question. Uh, Patricia, you would like to answer uh, immediately now or in the second round? I, I agree with Liliana, it takes a lot of time and uh, I um, I don't know if it is possible to have an agile uh, co-design process. Uh, one of the, the project that, that I uh, presented um, with uh, deaf people, I mean when you work with for example fragile people uh, you cannot be <coughs> agile. I mean it's a cultural process learning is a cultural process and when you co-design you mutually uh, learn from other people and other people learn from you so i don't think that this can be definitely <laughs> agile in a sense but um i think that is important to uh, acquire a cultural a point of view so um, and to avoid to work only on data data are cold you have you need a lens a lens to uh, interpret uh, data and uh, the data uh, are the shortcut that uh, quite often uh, industry use for uh, just, just cutting or reducing time uh, of course they, they have this uh, strict uh, requirement uh, but if you really want to co-design i think that you have to um, I mean, to consider that it is uh, a long process. Okay, thanks for the answer. Um, I would like just to go immediately to the second round because uh, I know that uh, Ross has to leave uh, at a certain point. And then uh, if uh, it will be allowed by uh, the chair, we will uh, take maybe a few minutes at the end. Uh, we have some few minutes at the end for the discussion if anyone would like to, uh, um, uh, to stress any, any issue or would like to, to make any comments, etc. So let's come to the uh, concrete perspective that are emerging from the pandemic. As you may have uh, uh, perceived, uh, also from the, the, the communication that we are about uh, in this conference, there's been a discovery of a lot of potentiality. Uh, just think, for example, to the diffusion of the online learning as smart work that has been also used in uh, uh, learning processes. But also we are faced with the fatiguing effect and also some time psychological effect. But nevertheless, there are some opportunities, some uh, that are emerging. And I would like just to make an example to launch the, the second round of the discussion. That is uh, uh, this tool. Uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the Ministry of Education in Italy as a, let's say, uh, launched uh, uh, and enforced a, a, a new tool that is called the uh, community uh, agreement. This community agreement has been done initially to uh, support the school that has considered a sort of uh, a potential engine of development of the uh, of the territory as we uh, consider in Aslet. And here you have two examples of an educational uh, agreement uh, realized in Naples and another educational agreement that has been realized recently, very recently in Rome, in uh, Torbella Monaca, that is a, a very critical uh, suburb of, of Rome. And uh, uh, within uh, that, this uh, um, these, uh, uh, contest, you can experience uh, a new way to uh, to co-design, co new way to uh, uh, learn and training the, the, the students. And uh, for example, uh, introducing them to new tools that uh, now are used by many designers. And uh, it's also very important that uh, from this experience, uh, uh, for example, uh, for the first time in the Italian school, uh, we were able to issue electronic certificate, uh, um, anchored, blockchain anchored that allow also to certificate the competence that have been acquired within this that can be considered a framework. And the idea is to expand this 
uh, approach as much as possible within and transversal to other uh, uh, learning uh, ecosystem. So this is just a small, very small example with respect, for example, to the other that has been done uh, as is proposed by Patricia, but this is related to school. So uh, now I would like to leave you the floor and uh, listen from you about respective uh, uh, change, uh, changes that you expect, uh, uh, the, under, the changes that has, um, has undergone the, the learning ecosystem during this pandemic, uh, and uh, what could be the contribution that may derive from the learning ecosystem to the Renaissance. Uh, that we expect and that may characterize the so-called the new normality. So I would like to give again uh, the floor uh, the first to Inga. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I, I, I do not think I'm able to answer that question very well. I would, um, however, say first that uh, it's been incredibly interesting to hear uh, uh, the positions and um, um, explorations from the other panelists from Ross and Sebastian and Aurelia and Patricia uh, on the cases and the projects and the work that you do which is really inspiring uh, absolutely inspiring and I see that there are so many shared values uh, absolutely um, in in much of what we do um, um, i do not know the smart learning ecosystems work for the past year during the covid 19 uh, but i have been thinking a lot about how will society change when or if we are coming back to a new normal but i don't think we are coming back to a new normal i don't think we are going to a situation as we were before um, i think we are seeing some uh, first reports at least from what i can see from norway regarding um, evaluations and assessments from the effects of uh, the uh, uh, ways of dealing with the pandemic in Norway, at least we see it in schools for children. Um, schools have been closed, universities have been closed. There has been home schooling, teachers, uh, meeting with their pupils uh, digitally. Uh, people have been working from home. So we have been accustomed to a way of thinking about ourselves as humans, as uh, people, as individuals who do not control everything. Um, we have learned that we can be the home for a virus that can spread by using our body as a home without our intention to spread the virus, which, um, which also makes us learn that we are part of a global community where things happen, which we cannot control and we try to manage with this. Uh, so distance, distance have become a new thing, right? Uh, we are few people in Norway. Um, we have lots of space. We have lots of fresh air. And in some senses, it has been a blessing in the pandemic to live in Norway, uh, being able to isolate ourselves, luckily, compared to many other places around the world, which are heavily affected. Um, but I don't think there will be a new normal because we have learned things during the pandemic and we don't know yet what we have learned, uh, but I do think we have learned things that um, might be useful. Thanks very much. Ross, would you like to say something before to leave? Uh, 
If I may, yes, thanks so much. And sorry, I have to uh, jump off. Um, I misjudged the timing today. Um, and I don't know if I'm actually going to answer your question precisely, Carlo. So apologies if I don't. But I was just reflecting on what Inga was saying and on the, the other uh, uh, inputs from from people who, and I would agree, you know, it's super energizing, not just at, not in a sort of superficial way, but I think in a very deep way to hear this work that's happening around the world, your work and other people's work. Um, and I do think we are, Inga, definitely part of a global community, but I don't think we are yet a field which is coherent or as, uh, dare I say, it, powerful enough. And I think through this kind of conversation, I see this kind of conversation as a way through which Perhaps we're try we can try to create the field of weaving smart or thriving learning ecosystems. Um, because I think every, um, everything of this nature requires a field, including research, including funding, including communications infrastructure, and this kind of gathering. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm just, I just wanted to reflect how positive I'm feeling about this conversation and to thank everybody um, and to um, yeah, look forward certainly to talking again in the future, I hope. Thanks, Ross, for your contribution, uh, uh, for sharing your ideas. Uh, I would like to ask now to Aurelio to... Thank, thank you, Carlo. For the second to, yeah. Please. And uh, well, uh, I would say uh, I see uh, COVID as 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 a catalyst, uh, perhaps for for change and uh, towards something that as you mentioned, a, a smart uh, learning ecosystems approach uh, in two ways. Um, one is related to to the technology itself, right? Uh, as as we as we saw uh, schools uh, forcing uh, themselves into a digital spaces, um, there was by default like increased adoption of innovative and more flexible practices in schools and student learning. Um, and, uh, and we could see, and that's something that uh, the, the schools that we engage with in this project uh, uh, shared with us, uh, also more openness to to adopt a wider range of teaching resources materials uh, like since you're already teaching in online why not uh, using more digital resources rather than just a textbook itself right um, so there, there's this uh, uh, openness that that emerged uh, through 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 the pandemic but I'll also say uh, in, a, in a more human dimension um, a change in, in, in mindset as well, uh, maybe increased uh, tolerance to risk, and that would say also more likelihood of engaging in, in uh, different types of projects with different partners. Uh, for example, um, we organized uh, during the pandemic last year uh, with a school in, 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 in Qatar, a, a digital learning festival, uh, that otherwise uh, the schools would have not had the appetite to like connect virtually a school uh, in Doha with one in the US and adjusting the same time zone. But uh, we heard from, from uh, teachers that they were so keen to expose students at that time to uh, something different, to have them engaging with students from elsewhere because they were all uh, engaging only with, it, with themselves, right? Uh, that they they opened themselves to this new opportunity and were more keen to put extra effort in making those connections. So, and that's where I see the opportunity. Since since we uh, saw this 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 moment of crisis with force uh, uh, engagement with with technology, there was also a, a, a force engagement with new types of, of of projects with new types of collaborations. Thanks, Aurelio. That's your time, Patrizia. Yeah, uh, Carlo, uh, it's a difficult question. I think that uh, we have just started
reflecting on what happened and we are still in the middle of looking at what is the future. So I don't know uh, what is the normal or the new normal. Uh, I can say that uh, at the very beginning with the first lockdown uh, for us in the fab lab, uh, it was a kind of disaster imagine that uh, we have a very experiential kind of learning we make and, and, and build and, and do stuff so it, it was very difficult to to do the same not in the lab but at home uh, but at that time uh, i saw a lot of creativity uh, also in the students uh, so we simulated for example a lot of machines at home and the students did this uh, it was very nice to see how they adapted uh, their environment uh, to continue in some way to, to, to do something similar or at least with a similar uh, perspective. Um, I, I think that uh, what was good is that in a very, very short time, a lot of people acquired uh, digital competencies that they didn't have at all. And uh, this was not just for the universities, but uh, any kind of degree. Um, so this was very positive. And as Aurelio uh, just said, uh, people started looking at new resources, new ways of sharing and doing things from distance. It was very interesting to see. Uh, I just would like to, to add something about the role of the, the fab labs during the pandemic. Um, we, we, did, we never closed, uh, we continued to work because we, we had a, a, an authorization from the, uh, from the, the, the director uh, because uh, the hospitals um, uh, really needed a lot of support. So we, we had to develop, uh, for example, um, uh, protective devices or respirators or this kind of things. Um, so we, we, we worked also during the, the, the lockdown in presence in the, in the fab lab, even if there were no one could, uh, could join us. Um, it was very interesting to me to see that if there is, uh, we don't think in terms of ecosystem, even the role of these fab labs is not really important, not really useful in the sense that, for example, a lot of fab labs started producing um, respirators, for example, uh, but these were not certified. And so, uh, in our case, instead of producing things or reproducing things, uh, we try to put together a kind of, uh, you know, change between the fab lab, the hospital uh, industries uh, and uh, certification um, institution. Uh, just to put all the actors in, um, in, in, in a sort of network together. So I, I'm convinced that this idea of the ecosystem is, is really important. Uh, I think we still don't know how to cope with the complexity in, in case like this, in case... Uh, what we lead with the, the, the pandemic. Uh, uh, but what I expect is a lot of reflections um, uh, out of this. And, um, and also about the, the environment and nature. Uh, nature is uh, renewed. Uh, re was uh, the our sea are cleaner, uh, the, the hair we breathe is cleaner. So maybe there is something that we have to still to learn about this. And maybe uh, this can produce a change in behavior in the future. OK, so it's not for now, but it's for the future. Uh, it's time for reflection, maybe still at <laughs> this, uh, this moment. But uh, Sebastian, uh, are you still there? I'll, I'll, I'll make it short. Uh, on my end, um, I think the world has realized how fragile formal education could be. 
I think the world has realized the potential that lies in their neighborhoods and their and their communities. Uh, and I had a third point, but I just forgot it. Um, but nonetheless, uh, to say that, um, so I think the crisis will have a long-term positive effect on learning ecosystems and the fact that so people have rediscovered the power of their communities as learning communities. Um, and that, yeah, for me, this is something that will, will stay. So I'm, I'm, I'm optimistic going forward. Okay, so the main message is uh, that we bring uh, home is that uh, people uh, increase their, um, let's say, digital skill and at the same time they really discover the power of community. So, and from there, we can start to build up uh, the, the future and the uh, new normality, if I well understood. Uh, is there any uh, um, comment from the ground? Is there anyone that would like to add some comment? <laughs> well, yeah. I yes. can make a, a comment. Um, I, I don't know if in your practice, but for me, uh, moving to the online, uh, context completely it was not a very huge <laughs> uh, difference but uh, having a hybrid um, in one moment I had to pay attention what was happening or happening face to face but at the same time I had to move my attention to the online and doing this simultaneously being online and face to face uh, in, within the context of a classroom. Uh, for me, that was the main challenge <laughs> that uh, had to face because uh, there are different stimuli, uh, stimuli on, the on the screen at the same time off the screen and having those information and <laughs> managing everything at the same time was the biggest challenge, and I think that um, with um, with within this context is to is to stay. Yeah, I don't know. indeed, uh, indeed, Liliana, this was a, a, a issue that arises also during the discussion we had uh, in the first day, and uh, this that is called the uh, um, parallel blend learning was not uh, the best that. Uh, the best strategies that can be adopted. But nevertheless, as we heard also by Stavros, uh, we know that uh, probably in the future, uh, we have to look to some sort of blended learning that is not parallel blended learning. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, give the right value to what does really uh, should be done in presence and the, uh, give the right value to the presence and give the right value to the to the uh, uh, online. It's uh, uh, difficult to find the right, the, mm, let's say the mm, reasonable mis mixing, but uh, we all know that all the actors actually um, uh, developed a certain sensibility and uh, for the advantages that can derive from the online interaction. So, this is another message that we uh, uh, bring home from uh, this uh, uh, this conference. Um, I don't know if this can give you uh, yeah. not an answer, but I mean uh, I uh, hope <laughs> yeah. sort of, uh, the possibility to go to uh, compare your feelings. Okay.